The laws of physics are the relations between the values of uh, physical magnitudes that you measure in a given reference frame. If you measure uh, the values of those magnitudes in another inertial frame, you will get different values. What the principle of special relativity tells you is that the relation between those uh, physical magnitudes, which is expressed by a physical law, cannot change. But the values that you measure of the physical magnitudes does change. If physics is not just uh, pure chaos, it is clear that the values that you measure in a given uh, reference frame, say the reference frame 1, okay, must be related somehow by uh, some rule with the values that you measure in another reference frame, let's say, 2. This relation is typically expressed as some transformation acting on uh, these um, values. Okay, let's say G. Now, if this transformation exists, it's clear that we must be able to find the inverse transformation. So, if we start with the values that you measure in the reference frame 2, clearly you should be able to get back the values measured in the reference frame 1. By the same token, we can consider a third uh, reference frame. And uh, there should be transformations and inverse transformations relating uh, these values to the values measured in the other reference frames 1 and 2. Clearly, these transformations, uh, by definition of inverse, they must uh, satisfy uh, these properties. I mean, okay. Uh, <coughs> GHK has to be one also, etc. This means that uh, all these transformations uh, are a group of transformations. This is the mathematical structure. Another thing is that there is an infinite number of reference frames. And clearly, there must be an infinite number of transformations. So we have a group that has an infinite number of elements, but there is a notion of uh, continuity within this group, in the sense that we can have two transformations which are very close to each other, because the difference between uh, the two inertial frames we are going to transform to are very uh, small. Okay, uh, so we are going to have a continuous group of transformations and this kind of continuous group is called a Lie group. Okay, this is the most common continuous group that you will find in uh, physics. The property that characterizes the transformations we are talking about is that they leave invariant the uh, laws of physics. When you have transformations that leave invariant something, uh, you call them uh, symmetry transformations. And uh, it should be clear that when you have a set of transformations, of symmetry transformations of a system, of a geometrical shape or body, they always form a symmetric group. Okay, so here we are interested in the symmetry group of the laws of physics, and uh, out of all the possible transformations that one may uh, perform, we are interested just in transformations which are associated to changes in inertial reference frame the changes of the values of some physical magnitudes uh, in different inertial reference frames. This group uh, is the, called uh, the Poincaré group. If we manage to identify this group, then uh, we could reformulate entirely the principle of special relativity. We could say that 
the laws of physics has to be implemented under the Poincare group, and that's it. Uh, so knowing this, what this Poincare group is, is uh, really very important. And this is what we are going to do next. To try to identify the transformations of this Poincare group by studying which transformations give invariant laws of physics, such as the invariance of the speed of light. The two physical magnitudes which are related by the law that states the constancy of the speed of light are length and time. So you have a light ray which is uh, propagating in space-time. Okay, it will uh, pass, uh, it will cover a distance delta L in a time delta T. And uh, the law states that uh, this is the constant C. Now, how do you measure delta L and delta T? In order to measure uh, distances and uh, time intervals, you need a reference frame. A reference frame that we call 1 consists on a clock that measures the time and gives you the coordinate time t. And uh, a special reference frame which uh, is given by three coordinates, which we take for the time being to be Cartesian. Okay, so we have these uh, four numbers that characterize something that takes place at uh, the point x, y, t at the time t. This is what we call a space-time event, or just event. It's the generalization of uh, a point, of a space point, to space and time. Now, before I go on and uh, remember how to compute delta L and delta T, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, some notation. Uh, we uh, theoretical physicists are very lazy people, so instead of writing x, y, and z, we write x1, x2, and x3, because this allows us to uh, write just x, i, instead of x1, x2, and x3 each time. Now, i is an index, which for coordinates will always be in upper position, okay? I will never lower uh, an upper index, which is in a coordinate. And these indices uh, with Latin letters i, j, k, etc. take values 1, 2, 3. Okay, so in the end, the space-time event is labeled by T and XI in the reference frame 1. So in this reference frame 1, in order to compute delta L, first I define delta XI uh, as uh, the difference between the coordinates at this point. at the original point x i 0 and x i 1 so final minus initial and uh, delta t will be the different uh, the difference in the time coordinate uh, of these two events these events are the passage of the light ray by these points at the given times t 0 and t1 so delta t is final time minus initial time this is just delta l which is what appears here in this law but uh, we still need some work to compute uh, delta l delta l we compute using the pythagoras theorem So uh, delta L squared, if you want, or delta L, uh, well, with no squares, we we'll just take the, the square root, will be the sum of the delta XI 
square. Okay. Again, since uh, we are very lazy, uh, each time uh, we, we have something like this in which we sum over some square quantities and these quantities have an, uh, this index i, 1, 2, 3. Okay, we uh, re express this in this way. And we observe that, or we take the convention, that each time we have a product like this uh, with uh, objects with the same index i, which is repeated, uh, we can just forget about the uh, sum of symbol because it is assumed that it's always like this. So delta xi delta xi means the same as the sum over this. Okay. So it is better to use this because uh, you save this uh, sum and you save some work and as I said uh, we are lazy people and we prefer to save time plus the fact that uh, the, clearly this notation is uh, advantageous because you uh, this is more complicated okay this is much uh, cleaner you immediately see the structure of what you are uh, summing uh, over uh, before I go on just let me tell you that this would be the same as delta xj delta xj. There is no difference in summing over uh, the index i or the index j. They take they run over the same the same values one, two, and three. So there is really no difference. This would be a sum by definition over j equal one to three, but this is delta x one square delta uh, x2 square and so on. It is exactly the same. It would be the same, okay, if uh, this was something like this. There is no sum here, okay. This is an object that has uh, delta x1, delta x2, delta x2, delta x3. This has three by three different uh, terms. Okay, so if that is delta L, and this is delta T, what we have is that uh, the square root of delta XI, delta XI, divided by delta T is equal to T. This is the law of uh, the constant T. It is uh, better uh, to uh, rewrite this expression by uh, multiplying everything by delta t, uh, squaring both sides, and uh, okay, in the end we get okay. This is a, another expression of the law uh, that tells us that the c is constant. But uh, this is not the final expression that we want because uh, we are going to find many times uh, the speed of light uh, multiplied by time. It has dimensions of length, just uh, like the deltas of uh, the coordinates, the spatial coordinates that we have here. So we find convenient to introduce another symbol, another label that works exactly like a coordinate, which is x0. So C delta T is uh, delta X zero. And we can rewrite this as delta X zero, delta X zero minus delta X I, delta X I equal to zero. And now, yes, this is from the final expression of this law that we were uh, trying to find. What happens in a uh, reference frame, uh, inertial reference frame 2? Okay, 
In this reference frame, uh, we have a different uh, clock that measures a different time and that uh, we call uh, T prime and a different uh, Cartesian uh, system uh, and we have different uh, Cartesian coordinates x i prime. Okay. The same events, okay, exactly the same, the passage of the light ray by a given point will take place at a uh, different time measured by uh, the clock in the uh, system 2. Okay, and the coordinates will have different values, so exactly the same uh, point, or the same event, will take place at these new coordinates. Okay. Uh, it's clear that I can define uh, delta T prime for uh, uh, the <coughs> time interval between these two events. I can also define the delta Xi primes. And what the principle of the special relativity tells me is that when I compute everything, uh, if I call C uh, T prime I call it x0 prime and so on, that I will uh, have the same law okay? and I will obtain exactly this expression. Okay, so this is the law that tells us that uh, the speed uh, of light C in reference frame 1 and C in reference frame 2. Uh, you see that this law has exactly the same form, but uh, the values of the physical magnitudes which are involved and related by this law may have and will have different values. And this is what uh, the principle of special relativity is uh, about. So the next step, or what we want to do now, is to find the relation between these uh, physical magnitudes and the transformation that takes us from this uh, delta x's uh, unprimed to the prime one. These transformations will be what we call the Poincaré transformations, and the set of all of them is the, what we call the Poincaré group. Uh, we need a bit more than uh, than this in order to find these uh, transformations. Uh, you see that the fact that these two uh, expressions, uh, which are almost the same, are equal to zero, does not, uh, or uh, does not, in principle, mean okay, that uh, they are equal in general. So take any two events now instead of. Uh, the passage of uh, a light ray, we are talking, for instance, uh, about the passage of an airplane. You compute uh, the delta x zeros and the prime ones, you compute the delta x i's and the delta x i primes. And uh, why should uh, these two things be equal? They were equal for a light ray because both of them were equal to zero, but you cannot conclude that these things are going to be equal always. In order to prove that these two constructions, these uh, two generalizations of uh, the square distance, okay, because this was uh, the square distance, this was the square distance, in these uh, reference frames, it's just a combination with the square of the time interval. In order to prove that they are equal, always, we need uh, to study an uh, experiment, <coughs> a mental experiment, which is called the Einstein clock. An Einstein clock consists on uh, two parallel mirrors and a light ray that bounces uh, in perpendicular direction between them. So a complete period of the clock is uh, consists on the light ray leaving the lower uh, mirror, going up, bouncing and coming uh, back. 
if the distance between the two mirrors is L, then we have this relation, that 2L having a complete uh, period divided by the period, delta T, is equal to the speed of light. Okay. At least in a reference frame in which this mirror is at rest. Okay. Suppose that this is uh, this happens in the reference frame one, okay, in which we have uh, another clock to measure to compare these uh, measurements, and we also have uh, the reference frame x two x one x three. Okay, and uh, we want to study two events that consist uh, that correspond to a complete period of the clock. So the first event happens at uh, t zero. Okay, and if we place the origin uh, of the coordinate system there, uh, we have x one, x two, and x three equal to zero. Okay, at uh, t zero plus delta t, which we can compute from uh, this relation, the position is again 0, 0, 0. Now let's consider these same two events in a different uh, reference frame, a reference frame that we call 2, at, that we assume that it uh, moves with respect to uh, the 1 at the speed v. So seen from reference 1, it moves with the speed v in the direction, uh, in the negative axis, uh, x1. Okay, uh, in this frame, you see uh, the mirror, okay, at the initial time t0, that here will be some initial time t0 prime, and this mirror is moving in this direction with uh, velocity v, and clearly, uh, the light ray cannot go in a perpendicular direction because otherwise it would miss the upper mirror because the upper mirror is also moving at the speed v. So it has to come out in this direction. Okay, it will bounce uh, in the upper mirror and it will bounce again, uh, it will return to the lower mirror. Okay, this will happen at the time t0 prime plus delta t prime over 2 and this will happen at t0 prime plus delta t prime which is the period of this uh, clock in the reference frame 2. Now in the first uh, interval, uh, <coughs> the first event, uh, if we make uh, the coordinate system, the prime coordinate system coincide at the origin of the mirror at the same time at which the light rate is emitted will take place at uh, the coordinate will be t0 prime but also 0, 0 and 0. And here uh, the coordinates will no longer be 0 so it will be t0 prime plus delta t prime. The coordinate x1 uh, will be the product of the speed v times delta t prime and uh, y and uh, sorry x2 and x3 uh, will be zero okay so these are the coordinates or the values of these four coordinates for these two events this in the reference frame 2 and this in the reference frame 1. Now, the relation between uh, the interval delta t prime and uh, the speed of light here uh, is uh, different because the distance that the light ray covers uh, is different. So we have to compute it will be twice this distance that we are going to compute using uh, Pythagoras theorem. We know that this is L and we know that this is V delta T prime divided by 2. 
So there is an assumption here, uh, and the assumption is that uh, distances in uh, directions perpendicular to the motion are not affected. Okay, they will not be transformed. So if this distance is L, it will remains L in the second coordinate system. Now, <coughs> the relation will be that twice, so this uh, distance is um, the square root of uh, L squared plus V delta T prime over 2 squared. This multiplied by 2 and divided by delta t prime square t prime it's also c so this is exactly the same relation as we saw before but uh, in uh, the coordinate system 2 so what can we learn from uh, all this before uh, we uh, start uh, making computations just uh, realize that the difference between this uh, mental experiment and uh, just the propagation of a light ray is that the two events that we are studying okay, that have these uh, coordinates in this uh, reference frame and these uh, coordinates in this other reference frame are not really related to the propagation of a light ray I, uh, we used light because this is how we, uh, we can use the constancy of the speed of light but uh, we could separate these uh, mirrors uh, more or less so as to make coincide the two events with any two times that we want. For instance, we carry this uh, pair of mirrors or this clock in an airplane and uh, we set up uh, the distance between the mirrors in such a way that uh, we make uh, coincide the two uh, events with uh, two points uh, that we want in the trajectory of the airplane. Okay, uh, so now uh, let's see what happens. This, uh, the first thing that we have to realize is that uh, we can rewrite this as usual in a different way. So let me first take uh, this relation, okay, and uh, using a uh, Elementary algebra, I can rewrite it in this way. Or if you want in this way. Now let me take this other equation and uh, squaring it and everything I get uh, C delta T prime square minus uh, V delta T prime square equal for L square now you see that V delta T prime is just delta x1 prime okay because the initial x1 is zero and the final x1 is uh, x1 prime sorry is v delta t prime okay so i can replace this by delta x1 prime square and in the end what i get is that delta x0 prime delta x0 prime minus delta x1 prime delta x1 prime is equal to 4 L square. Uh, these two relations uh, look different but uh, that is because we uh, have not uh, considered uh, what happens to delta x1 and so on. So delta x1 is 0 because the final x1 is 0 and the initial x1 is 0. So we could have added here uh, 
and in fact uh, we can uh, since uh, delta x2 is zero and delta x3 is zero and the same happens to delta x2 prime and delta x3 prime you find that uh, we can write this Okay, so these two things are equal, and here the important thing to realize is that you can change L as much as you want, and you can arrange things so that these two events that we are considering coincide with any two events that we want, any two events. So the consequence is that delta x0, delta x0 minus delta xi, delta xi, is always the same it's always the same value measure in any two inertial uh, reference frames and for any two events So the constancy of the speed of light translates into uh, the constancy of this combination of physical magnitudes. This particular combination, which plays, of course, a fundamental role, is called the interval. The relativistic or the invariant interval, depending on the literature. Okay, and uh, what we just see is that the interval is something invariant, and this is why it's called invariant interval, under whatever relation there is between two initial reference frames. Now the idea is that uh, we can characterize all the transformations between uh, inertial reference frames as those transformations that leave invariant the interval. In other words, we can say that the transformations that takes us from x0, xi to x0 prime, xi prime into uh, any two inertial reference frames uh, leave invariant the interval are what we call Poincare transformations. by definition, and they form a group. Now, before we go on, uh, just to mention that these Poincaré transformations are not too mysterious, okay? There are very simple Poincaré transformations. For instance, those that leave uh, invariant just delta x0 and delta xi. If this are invariant, then the interval is clearly invariant because it only depends on these deltas. So which kind of transformations leave invariant these uh, delta axios, the increments or the differences or whatever you want to call them? Well, clearly if I shift x0 by some constant, we call it a0, okay, then uh, this, uh, if, I, if the relation between the coordinates is this, then uh, for uh, the event 0, I will have this, okay, this is constant for any two events, 
and the same will happen for the one. They will both be shifted. This just I add a second, uh, three seconds, whatever, and uh, clearly the difference. is the same okay the same uh, I can do uh, for uh, the spatial coordinates I can shift them by three arbitrary constants a i so a1 a2 and a3 for uh, each of the coordinates and clearly this will uh, give uh, this invariant now what are these uh, transformations? Okay, this transformation is telling you that uh, the second uh, reference frame has a clock which is uh, shifted uh, by a c o seconds with respect to the other one. Okay, c times uh, divided by c. Okay, the second. So you, the origins of time are just shifted. It's just like that. And this is telling you that uh, there is a difference in the position of the origins of coordinates of these two reference frames. But if the uh, transformation is just this, this corresponds to two uh, reference frames which are at rest one with respect to the other, whose, in, uh, whose uh, axis uh, of the uh, whose coordinate axis are parallel, and the the only difference is that the origins are placed at different points uh, that the clocks have started at different times that's all okay these are constant uh, these are space-time translations time translations and space-time translations so these are the simplest transformations that you can uh, uh, make at the simplest two uh, Poincare transformations because they preserve the interval. Okay, we are going to need uh, a bit more uh, notation because uh, I am a theoretical physicist and I am getting tired of uh, writing the index zero and the indices i all the time. So I am going to introduce a new set of indices. These are Greek letters, mu, nu, rho, etc and uh, they uh, take the values uh, 0, 1, 2, and 3, so all of them, or if you want, 0 and i. So now my uh, x mu, if I write some, the set of all the x mu's, corresponds to x0 and x i. And uh, the interval, which was delta x0, delta x0 minus delta xi delta xi well you see I cannot write it as just delta x mu delta x mu because this would be a sum okay, of all the terms which would mean that uh, this I could have delta x0 delta x0 plus delta xi delta xi so this cannot be this is not uh, useful I need to introduce something else. So how do I write uh, this? I have to introduce another object which is this eta mu nu. Eta mu nu has these values. Okay, so this is supposed to be a double sum. Now I use this convention, so this is a sum from mu equal to 0 to 3, a sum over from uh, mu equal to 0 to 3 of uh, delta x mu, eta mu nu. And this eta mu nu are coefficients for this sum. Clearly, I want eta 0, 0 to be plus 1, and eta 1, 1 equal to eta 2, 2 equal to eta 3, 3 equal to minus 1. Okay. This I can express in a different way. I can say that eta ij, okay, so this only refers to indices 1, 2, and 3, is minus 
delta i j. This is the Kronecker delta. So delta i j is equal to 1 when i is equal to j and to 0 if i is different to j. Okay, this is my convention. There is a completely valid and opposite convention in which eta 0, 0 is minus 1 and uh, eta 1, 1, eta 2, 2 and eta 3, 3 are plus 1. Okay, so be aware that uh, my definition of the interval is what is called uh, the minus, uh, the mostly minus convention. And many people use the mostly plus convention in which the interval has the opposite sign. So there are many different signs all over the place, but uh, the combination is uh, still uh, the same up to the global sign. Okay, so I can write uh, the interval in this way. Okay, and before I, I go on, I am going to do uh, to uh, a bit more notation because there is a useful way of uh, dealing with these uh, uh, operations in terms of uh, conventional column and row vectors and uh, matrices. Okay, so typically one writes delta x mu as a column vector And eta mu nu as a matrix with components only diagonal components and the rest of components that I don't I'm not writing uh, are zero. Okay. Then uh, with this notation, I uh, can write uh, it has the same value because in the end this is just a number okay. this is the same as uh, let me call this just delta x I would use some uh, both phase if I could but uh, let me not do it it would be delta x transposed eta I call this just eta the matrix eta and the column vector x. So this is the transpose is a row vector delta x0, delta x1, delta x2, delta x3, then you have 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1, and the column vector delta x0, delta x1, delta x2, delta x3. And of course you get exactly the same value. So a bit more about this notation. These are uh, just numbers. It's delta x mu. It's just uh, some uh, component. So this would be the same as eta mu nu delta x mu delta x mu. Or I can uh, change the order completely. Okay. And uh, write uh, delta x mu eta mu nu. It doesn't matter. All these are numbers. So when you replace the values of the indices, it is zero, 0 is just one number, delta x mu is one number, etc. But in this notation, this is a vector, this is a transpose vector, this is a matrix, this is a vector, and uh, the order uh, in which you multiply them matters, as you know well, very well. Okay, another thing uh, that I haven't mentioned is uh, how I conclude that uh, the components of eta mu are this. Okay, there is uh, the convention, as you know, for a matrix would be that this is the component eta 0, 0, eta 0, 1, eta 0, 2, and so on, eta 1, 0, eta 1, 1, etc., etc. Okay, this is uh, essentially uh, the convention. For me, in general, uh, vectors will be uh, column vectors, and uh, if I write a, a row vector, I will write it as the uh, transpose of a column vector. I can uh, 
introduce this uh, vector notation also for the coordinates uh, themselves. Okay, I don't like it uh, because so this would be the vector x0, x1, x2, x3. I don't like it because it will make you think that uh, x is really a vector and uh, it is not a vector in the sense that we are going to uh, use in this course. It is uh, really not a vector in a geometrical or uh, mathematical sense, except in very pe particular cases. Since we don't want to restrict ourselves to these very peculiar cases, uh, we will just uh, see x not as a vector. However, here, just for the purpose of uh, doing calculations, it's just a convenient notation. Okay, so x will be this vector. And, um, okay, why do we introduce this uh, notation? It's just useful for uh, identifying uh, more Poincaré transformations. If I introduce a vector, a column vector, a0, a1, and so on, uh, the first Poincaré transformations that we have identified, the space-time translations, are just x prime equal to x plus a. Now, the rest of the Poincaré transformations are linear transformations acting on uh, the coordinates x. So they are x prime of the form x prime equal to lambda, where lambda is some matrix times x. Okay, this matrix, uh, I would like to write it uh, now in components, okay, will be uh, of this form, this is x mu prime, and okay, the indices in one side and another of an equation must always agree. So if this has a free index mu, and it is free because there is, it is not repeated, we haven't summed over it, so this equation, just like this, this is a vector equation if you want, this is another equation that is really a set of equations, one for each value of uh, mu. Okay, here we have uh, x nu. So there must be a repeated index because otherwise we would be uh, having uh, some uh, mismatch between this is in the right and the left uh, side. And uh, our convention is that we always uh, sum when it is uh, when they uh, we are dealing with Greek indices will be some uh, upper and lower indices. So this matrix will be represented by this object lambda mu mu. Okay, now let me uh, uh, make this more explicit. This is x0 prime, x1 prime, and so on. And uh, the components of this matrix will be lambda 0, 0, lambda 0, 1, and so on lambda 1, 0, lambda 1, 1, and so on, and x0, x1, etc. And if you multiply as a matrix this uh, by this vector, you will get exactly the same result as this, which by definition, okay, you see in the, the Einstein convention, this is lambda nu, sorry, the sum is over the index nu, x nu. So this is nu 0 x 0 plus lambda nu 1 x 1 plus etc. until. Now we want to study the effect of these linear transformations of the coordinates on the interval and then see what are the conditions that lambda has to satisfy in order for the interval to be invariant, the interval between any two events. So let's consider two events with coordinates x mu 0 and x uh, mu 1. It's clear that uh, uh, the coordinates of both uh, events transform exactly in the same way, because this is the generic transformation. So this is satisfied both for 0 and 1. And if I want to compute now the transformation of the difference between these uh, coordinates, okay, which is x1 minus x mu zero prime, then uh, by linearity this is going to be this and uh, okay. 
to conclude that these deltas transform linearly as well. If you rewrite this in a matrix language, well, it would be just like this. So delta x prime transforms linearly. Now let us consider the uh, invariance of the interval. So in this uh, language, which is component language, the one with indices uh, mu, we have this expression. And uh, in uh, matrix language, you have uh, this expression. Okay, these are exactly identical formulas written in two different uh, languages or conventions or whatever you want to call them. The important thing is that uh, observe that in the left hand side there is no eta prime. Okay, and that is because uh, eta is the same uh, before and after the transformations. It is invariant under the transformations. Uh, this is not an invention. <coughs> This is what uh, you have here already. Uh, the coefficients of these deltas are exactly the same in uh, the prime case and in the unprime case. So uh, eta is always the same, and in fact, uh, the condition of invariance of the interval in the end uh, can be reformulated in terms of a condition on the invariance of this object eta for which we haven't uh, a name uh, yet, but uh, which will play a very important role later. So let us uh, consider first uh, this uh, form, the component uh, form of the invariance of the interval. And we want to replace in this formula this uh, transformation law. See that uh, the index nu has already been uh, used here, so if we uh, replace delta x mu prime with lambda mu nu, then we are going to have a problem, okay? The, this, this will not be, uh, using this notation in which you sum over repeated indices, this sum and this sum will be synchronized somehow. And uh, this is not what the formula tells you, this sum is independent of this sum. Uh, in order to avoid this, uh, what you do is uh, call this index something different, so you call it rho, for instance, okay? And uh, okay, so this formula becomes um, lambda mu rho delta x rho eta mu nu, and then we have delta x nu. Delta x nu, uh, you just get it uh, by uh, if it is delta x nu, then this lambda in the in the right hand side. Okay, instead of nu, we'll have nu. And another thing is that because we have already used uh, rho here, uh, then we will have to replace rho by uh, something else, like sigma. So, uh, okay, what we have is um, eta mu sigma delta x sigma. We can always change in these formulas any index which is repeated by any other index of the same kind. We can change it by any other Greek letter. It always means exactly the same. We cannot change it by the Latin letter because by definition, or by convention, uh, the range of values that uh, the Greek indices take and the <coughs> Latin indices take is different. In any case, the right-hand side of this equation is not transformed. It's just as it is. Delta x nu. Okay, and uh, if we want to compare these two sides, okay, we should uh, be able to rewrite this in terms of uh, delta x mu here, or delta x rho and delta x sigma here. Uh, okay, maybe it's simpler if we uh, change this by rho and this by sigma.
so all the of all the technical problems and now we can compare these two sides okay this is true for any delta x rho any delta x sigma so the conclusion is that you have uh, lambda mu rho so the coefficients of delta x rho and delta x sigma which you have here and here are the same in both places so okay and this is the condition that the matrices lambda mu nu have to satisfy and this is what defines a Lorentz transformation So this is the set of all Lorentz transformations is a subset of uh, Poincaré transformations. I repeat, the Poincaré transformations are all the transformations that preserve the interval. Lorentz transformations are just the linear transformations. So there are other Poincaré transformations, which are the linear transformations that we saw before. And uh, in fact, there are no more than the linear ones and uh, the uh, shifts, uh, the translations that we saw before, and combinations of both. In uh, the matrix language, you have uh, lambda delta x transposed eta, lambda delta x equal to lambda equal to delta x transposed eta delta x. The transpose of uh, the product uh, is uh, the product but uh, of the transpose but in the uh, <coughs> inverse order. So it is this delta x and now you compare the coefficients of delta x t delta x here and uh, you see that uh, I have missed uh, on lambda so you conclude that uh, lambda t eta lambda is equal to eta okay so again this is by definition a lambda that satisfies this property that leaves invariant theta is a Lorentz transformation All the lambdas that satisfy this property, all the, land, all the Lorentz transformations form the Lorentz group. And uh, you see that this is very similar to the rotation group. Uh, rotations uh, preserve the length. So just as an exercise, just consider the, the three-dimensional uh, case. You have uh, coordinates xi, only special coordinates, and you consider linear transformations ij. And um, <coughs> if they preserve the distance, which is the main property of rotations, so the distance uh, here is just xi, xi. Okay. So you want this to be preserved then they are called rotations this is the property that defines rotations now I come here and I see that this is R I J X J R I and I have to use something else K X K and uh, okay comparing these uh, two sides I arrive to the conclusion that uh, R I J R I K has to be equal to delta J K for this to be a rotation. Okay, let me do this in uh, uh, vector language. Okay, uh, rotations act like this linearly, and uh, Uh, you can write it like this, or if, uh, or maybe better x transposed x, 
and uh, you want this to be x to the power of time x prime and this is r t sorry for some reason this does not delete anything this is um, x t r t r x and here the condition is that r t r has to be 1 so these are the same conditions but expressed in, in different ways you can always put uh, a 1 uh, here so you could uh, write this using delta uh, or uh, of the unit matrix uh, like this so uh, this would be r uh, i need the different indices so i can write r i j delta i j and k l equal to delta k l i have changed these indices or i can write r t 1 r equal to 1 Okay, same, the two things are the same. Okay, now let me compare this expression that tells you that uh, rotations are linear transformations that leave invariant this delta, which is this one, with uh, these expressions that we got here that tell you that Lorentz transformations are linear transformations that uh, leave invariant this eta. Okay, there is a notation for this. Uh, you see that they are uh, analogous. Okay, these kind of transformations are called uh, orthogonal transformations, and uh, the transformations that belong to the uh, that uh, all these transformations form the orthogonal group, which is denoted by O. But they are called orthogonal with respect to this uh, delta here. Now this delta, or this one, has a 1, 1, 1 uh, in the diagonal and nothing else. So it has three ones. So this group is called O3. This is the three-dimensional orthogonal group. Okay, this is the three-dimensional orthogonal group. of the rotations that you know so what should we call the Lorentz group okay uh, well eta has uh, one plus and three minuses okay so uh, you could call this o1 comma 3 or 3 comma 1 depends on uh, your conventions so it is another sort of orthogonal group but uh, the difference is uh, the object that is preserved and that we will call uh, metric. Okay, so this is uh, another orthogonal group and it is the Lorentz group. So summarizing, uh, we have uh, arrived to the result that the point carry group. contains uh, space-time translations uh, and Lorentz transformations that we will study in a bit more detail okay this is space-time translations remember that have this form where a mu is uh, a set of constants, so it's a vector, um, and uh, Lorentz transformations uh, have this form. So, a Poincaré transformation is of this form, the most general.
edge of this one. Okay, here I'm not going to prove that indeed this is the most general Poincare transformations. I just have argued that uh, space time translations are certainly Poincare transformations. Lorentz transformations are by definition uh, Poincare transformations. And uh, for the moment, you just uh, can uh, accept the fact that the most general Poincare transformation is a combination of these uh, two kinds of transformation. Uh, one uh, thing about uh, these transformations, one important thing is that just as uh, rotations are, uh, do not commute in the sense that if you perform a transformation R1 and then another transformation R2, okay, so if you perform them afterwards, it will be like this. Uh, okay, this is not the same as performing them in different order in general. So the group uh, of uh, <coughs> rotations is not commutative. Or non abelian. An abelian group is a commutative group. The same happens uh, for the Lorentz group and hence for the Poincare group. Space time, the group of space time translations is commutative or abelian, but the Lorentz transformations are not, and the most general Poincare transformations uh, are not. Okay, the next uh, step uh, will be to study in a bit more detail what is the form of these uh, Poincare transformations. We know what is the form of these uh, of the space time uh, translations. So we just need to study what is this lambda uh, mu nu. We want to relate uh, the components of this uh, lambda mu nu with uh, the parameters that uh, tell us how one initial frame moves with respect to the other. 